Hey there, this is Sean and Manish with Skyflow. And today we're talking about some of the challenges that companies face when it comes to securing their customer data. So this is sensitive customer data, things like names, emails, addresses, banking information, healthcare information, and so on. And how you can use a data privacy vault to actually address some of these challenges. So Manish, starting with the challenges, do you mind walking us through some of the problems that companies face when it comes to actually securing their customer data? Sure, so let's start with a very simplified architecture diagram for pretty much any tech company. Mm -hmm. uh, you're probably collecting some sensitive user information of the types you mentioned from the from like a browser app or a native app, sending it through some middleware components like a API gateway, load balancer, to your backend for processing, and more importantly, storage. And then you got other processes that pick it up from um, your main database through an ETL pipeline that and store it in your data warehouse for your dashboards, your business analytics, machine right. learning. So let's say we are collecting some sensitive information, like in your example, like a phone number from the user. Mm -hmm. And if we collect it from here in the in the front end, and we send it to your backend via middleware, often middleware will um, end up writing logs, mm -hmm. which accidentally or sometimes by design, incorrect or otherwise, end up writing that information in the logs. Um, now the information goes to your backend, which has to process them. So it's in memory, it's in probably temporary storage somewhere, also in logs that your backend generates. Um, but of course, by design, it has to store it in your database. So now your database has this phone number. Mm -hmm. um, and then your ETL process picks up, it also has its own logs and its own processing systems, and it stores again this entire data record for this user, which includes a phone number in the data warehouse. And now the analytics has access to all of this for because it needs to read the data record. Mm -hmm. So in, even in this super simplified example, you can kind of see that there's a whole bunch of components uh, owned by perhaps different teams running on different stacks that have accidentally gotten access to data often when they didn't need it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So obviously the phone number here is being like copied everywhere, but and we don't maybe people have access to it that we don't want to have access, or services have access to it that we don't want to have access. But couldn't we just encrypt the phone number to secure it and that way, you know, we're essentially locking down access to the phone number? So encryption is a great technology um, and it solves a lot of problems. For instance, if this phone number was encrypted and you lost your database or you lost a backup tape for your database, you wouldn't have to worry so much about the fact that the phone number itself was, was exposed. Mm -hmm. However, encryption does have some problems. Like for one, depending on the compliance problems you're trying to reach, uh, encryption may not be sufficient to meet your compliance requirements. With Encryption, like with any tool, when you use it, you have to make sure you're doing it right. So you mm -hmm. use the right encryption algorithm, and the right chaining modes and things like that. Um, and you rotate your keys appropriately. But even then, there are problems that you want need to solve beyond just simple data protection that encryption doesn't solve or sometimes makes a little bit harder. For instance, imagine you have you have a key that you're using to encrypt all phone numbers. Mm -hmm. And you have not just one phone number, obviously, because you're hoping to get more than one customer. You have 10. Mm -hmm. Now, if this particular phone number needs to be deleted because of a request made by the user, now you can't quite go delete the key because that would shred your other nine phone numbers as well. Mm -hmm. So in this case, you would have to still solve the problem of tracing this where all this data lives, encrypted or not, and delete it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So all right, I guess so. Like encryption essentially it secures the information, but doesn't necessarily solve some of the like larger issues about like deleting the information exactly. and, and other challenges. So how do you how do you actually solve that problem then? So the way we recommend people think about this is that you have various classes of data. Like for instance, in this phone number example, you're probably using the phone number to contact the user and you've got information like how often did the user read the message. Mm -hmm. After they read the message, how likely were they to come back and interact with your with your site. Most of the data is is fine from a regulatory compliance, privacy, security perspective. Mm -hmm. You obviously don't want to lose any of it but it does not have the same regulatory and security risk that having the phone number itself does. Phone number and other such information obviously is special. And we believe that belongs in a data privacy world, not spread all over your, your architecture. Mm -hmm. So to follow that through as an example, um, you would basically take the phone number and instead of passing it on everywhere, you would store the phone number in your vault itself. So the vault would have the phone number and what the vault would do for you is, the vault would return a pointer, in this case, let's say a token, um, 
to you that would stand in for the phone number because the vault does the translation between token and phone number and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And you would take the token, not the original phone number, and pass it through your systems. So what your logs, the worst case your logs can expose is the token, not the actual phone number. Mm -hmm. What you would store in your database is not the phone number, but just the, the token. Um, and since that's all you have, you would, that is exactly all you would have proliferating through your system, the token, not the phone number. Mm -hmm. So in this point in time, encryption is kind of um, good to have, but not a must have. I see. Okay, so essentially what we're doing here is we're moving the phone number and presumably other customer data into sort of the single source of truth of the data privacy vault. And then exactly. returning tokenized versions of that data and then storing the tokenized versions through our existing infrastructure and then always referring to those those tokens. Exactly. But how do we actually address the issue of like access? Um, you know, presumably not all these systems need to be able to detokenize the data, but some of them probably do. So how do we control access to the systems that can tokenize and detokenize the data and actually a access the plain text values? That's a great question. So uh, I think the first observation we need to make here is that for a lot of accesses, you don't actually need to access the data element in question. So mm -hmm. for instance, if um, going back to our previous example, if what you wanted to answer was, what is the efficacy rate of a particular campaign? In mm -hmm. other words, how often after receiving a message does a user go transact with the website? Mm -hmm. You don't really need to know the phone number at all. That's an analysis you can probably do with the data that you have in your systems already. Mm -hmm. To take that a little bit further, maybe you want to break that down by how do people in different area codes react to my, uh, my messaging? Is there a, a difference in behavior? In that case, the observation is that even when you do need access to the phone number, you don't need access to the entire phone number. A phone number is a structure with multiple sub-elements. In this case, a vault that understands that a phone number is not just any bunch of bytes, it is a phone number and has these different components to it, can give you the ability to configure access for your analytic system to only the area code and nothing else. Mm -hmm. So you would configure your analytic system with the right access so it can extract the area code. So you would configure your analytic systems with the right permissions to access only the area code so it can continue to perform its analytics as before. Mm -hmm. I see. So in that case, essentially, like rather than the analytics having being able to detokenize the full phone number and have access to the full plain text value, they would only be able to access, say, the area code and then perform analytics on the area code or the grouping of the customers exactly. that have that area code. Okay, so we talked a lot about some of the challenges that businesses face when it comes down to securing customer data. So let's take an actual like real life use case. So let's say that I want to use marketing automation to send a text message to some subset of my customers to send them a marketing message and through a service like Twilio. Under normal circumstances, you would have some part of your application infrastructure passing the plain text value of the phone number over to Twilio. So presumably Twilio still needs to be able to access the plain text value. So how can you use this infrastructure in a way that can still send a text message through a service like Twilio without actually exposing any of your application infrastructure to the plain text value of the phone number? So that's a great use case. To to kind of draw out what, what you effectively said mm -hmm. is you have, let's say, a CRM process um, that that picks up um, your, your data yeah. and picks a phone number or a set of phone numbers and sends it to Twilio, and Twilio is essentially sending a message to the user. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the first cut at trying to solve this problem would be the observation that you don't really need to have your entire system know the phone number in order to do this. It's only your CRM system that needs to have access to this phone number. So uh, kind of going to our previous example, you, would, you could configure the CRM system with the privileges to access the phone number from the vault. Mm -hmm. In this case, the entire phone number, as, as opposed to the previous case where we only needed the area code. Mm -hmm. um, and that solves the problem because the CRM system only needs to change to make a call to the vault first to get the phone number um, detokenized, and then proceed with its normal flow. Mm -hmm. And that solves the problem without ex and adding any exposure to the rest of your system. But we can do one better than that. If you make the observation that the CRM system doesn't actually need to have access to the phone number, it just needs to be able to use the phone number in order to send the message, we can build a, a much better system. Mm -hmm. The way we do that is we give the CRM the permission to tell the vault 
to take the, the phone number token that mm -hmm. we have, to detokenize it and call the Twilio system on its behalf with the actual phone number. Mm -hmm. in the, instead of the CRM system having to call the Twilio system directly, what you have is you have the CRM system dealing only in tokens mm -hmm. and the Twilio system is dealing only in phone numbers as it needs to. So in this case, the CRM system along with the rest of your system does not need to actually have access to the entire phone number mm -hmm. and you can continue to maintain your end-to-end -end use case exactly as it was before. I got it. So in this case, essentially what we're doing is under the conventional setup, the CRM is calling the Twilio API directly with passing the phone number. And what the change we're making is that instead the CRM is going to call like a vault API using the tokenized data, then the vault is going to call Twilio's APIs passing the actual real data, in this case, the phone number. Exactly. Okay. So let's take another uh, situation. So we've talked a lot about using the data actually that's in the vault, but what about collection? So in a normal web application, a lot of the times we're going to be collecting account data. So this could be someone's name, email address, phone number, maybe the home address. And normally, you know, I would create a, a web application that is secured through, you know, HTTPS, so it's encrypted the information during transit, and I'm going to pass that through probably my API gateway to my back end and then end up with the data in my database. And through everything that we talked about today, obviously we don't want to do that in terms of uh, the security issues with actually protecting that data. So I want to get the information in the vault, but how do I get that information in the vault without actually exposing the data into my back end? So what we did here was we, we moved the access of the actual information mm -hmm. as late as we could in the in the data life cycle. Right. So instead of giving the, the data warehouse or even the CRM system access to the real phone number, we moved it out as much as possible till the last step where you actually do need a phone number. Mm -hmm. So the principle here is that you want data to be detokenized as late as possible. When you reverse that, what you want is you want the data to be tokenized as early as possible. So continuing with your example, if I'm collecting the data here, mm -hmm. I want to tokenize maybe not here, better to tokenize here, or even better if I can tokenize right here. So right. for instance, instead of your front-end application having the responsibility to collect the sensitive information, and we have to remember that even front-end applications are fairly complex. Beasts, they have integration with logging tools, monitoring, observability tools. So there is a fairly complex ecosystem here that is ex being exposed to sensitive information. Instead of that, if you could basically ask your vault on your behalf, on your instructions and your styling and, and your UI assets to collect the phone number, translate it to the token right up here, so your front-end application and therefore all the rest of your thing deals mm -hmm. only in tokens, that's kind of the best of all possible worlds. Mm -hmm. Now, no, that's not always possible. Some cases you may be getting the sensitive data not from your front-end application, but from a different application via an API or some such thing, or you're collecting it from a third party. So things vary, um, and different architectural constraints may lead to different choices. So you could have a API gateway that intercepts calls coming in from other third parties and use that to, to tokenize the information at at collection point, mm -hmm. or maybe your back end, once it gets the data, collects it. So different architectural choices uh, are possible, mm -hmm. but in all cases, if you stick with the principle of tokenizing as early as possible, you get the most secure system. Right, okay, so essentially with this whole infrastructure, the approach that we're taking is we're is it isolating and protecting the data, uh, at least the sensitive data, inside the data privacy vault, and then we're Perfect. tokenizing as early as possible and detokenizing as late as possible. Exactly. Got it. All right, well, thank you so much, uh, Manish, for uh, talking about some of the challenges the companies face when it comes to securing customer data and how to use a data privacy vault to actually address those challenges. If you want to learn more about data privacy vaults and Skyflow, you can check us out at skyflow.com. And thank you very much for watching. Remember, move fast, but don't break privacy. Mm -hmm.